everybody. Great to see you folks uh, this morning. My name is Reverend Isaac. I'm a minister here at Trenton United, just in case you didn't remember me because I've uh, been away for uh, the last few weeks. I just wanted to say a really big thank you to everybody who has uh, continued in leadership over this uh, past month to be able to help our church to thrive and uh, continue to um, bless both uh, ourselves and our wider community. And uh, a special thanks to, to our worship leaders, um, Reverend Katie, Lisa, um, Reverend Ian, and then Diane and Yvonne, uh, who is uh, filling in for Diane today. I think last week too, last right? One. Oh, okay, last one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is the last one. So um, I have a few announcements that I'd like to bring to your attention. Uh, first of all, uh, we'd love it if you could follow us on social media. If you are somebody who uses Facebook or Twitter, we love it too uh, when you're able to like our posts or share them with other people. You can even go on Google Maps and find Trent United and then give us a five-star review, right? Because you wouldn't want to give us anything less, right? And then that's going to make people want to come here even more. So uh, and we can share in the great time we have here together. Um, so we continue to be in the middle auditorium because of uh, the sanctuary repairs. Um, I think we set a tentative date. Um, I think it's going to be, it's either the third or the fourth Sunday in, uh, in September that we're hoping to be back upstairs. So. Uh, um, once I actually tell you a real date, mark that in your calendar, but you might have to wait until uh, um, we just, uh, I need to check in with a few folks from council just to make sure that we're still on track for, for uh, those dates. But uh, we're so happy that the Parrot Foundation has uh, given us um, the $210,000 to be able to make um, these repairs and then over $10,000 from you folks have been uh, received. And we hope that um, if you still haven't had the chance yet, if you'd like to be able to support um, just those last few thousand dollars to be able to make sure that we don't have to um, use any reserved funds, we would love it if you could support this amazing work at the church. In terms of children's programming, our official Sunday school um, uh, ended at the beginning of June, but if you'd like to be able to head into the awesome room and use that space and uh, do uh, use some of the, the different activities that are, that are there, you are welcome to do so. Our summer worship hours, you made it, you're here at 10 a.m., so you know that um, that summer worship hours start at 10 until, um, and up, up until and including September 1st. Uh, choir practices aren't taking place on Wednesdays right now, but they will resume on September 4th. That's great to see uh, you folks still over there, and uh, thank you for, for coming and, uh, and, and partying with Yvonne up here at the front. Our stewardship update. Trenton United Church's mid-year financial update reveals a shortfall of just over $21,000. Now, that's a lot of money. It is an improvement from last year's $35,000 deficit at this time. So the Stewardship and Finance Committee wants to thank all of you for your generosity as donations are vital to supporting our ministries and covering local expenses. As we move into the second half of the year, let's continue offering financial support and service. And with collective effort and, of course, God's guidance, we can achieve our goals for 2024. Coming up on August 10th, which I believe is this Saturday, is the uh, Tyendinaga traditional powwow. And we had guests from Tyendinaga who came for our uh, flag raising back in um, back in June. So uh, in terms of you can plan your day, you can go online, I believe, and buy tickets. Maybe folks from the church would like to carpool. And then if you want to check the link in your email blast this week, you can um, go right to the Tyendinaga powwow schedule for this coming Saturday. I'm going to go if anybody wants to carpool. Okay, talk to Katie <laughs> um, for carpooling. Or just because she's nice. So <laughs> Um, we're having ongoing discussions uh, to, uh, in terms of the possibility of moving down to 80% time for myself. So just a reminder that um, congregational feedback is more than welcome to our ministry and personnel committee. And we will are planning to have a meeting in September to uh, finalize some of those decisions. Uh, but just to keep that in mind that that's coming up. Our new photo directory, the photos will be taking place from September 24th to 28th with Universal Portrait Studios. And I believe Lisa is going to um, uh, talk to us next Sunday about uh, how you can start making your bookings. So that's exciting. 
A reminder that we have a great prayer chain team, uh, many of the folks who are here or in different places within our community, and if you have a prayer request that you would like our prayer group to be praying for, please reach out to Reverend Katie, um, and her phone number and uh, email are present in, are, are there in the email blast that goes out each week in the announcement sheet, or you can contact the office. Um, we are always looking for people to help out with morning hospitality and coffee time. Dawn, can you wave at people just in case anybody doesn't know who Dawn is? Uh, you can talk to Dawn in terms of uh, if you'd like to help out with some of the coffee. I'm talking a lot about coffee today, by the way, in the service, so this is exciting. Um, and then remember, our announcement submissions are Wednesdays at 10 a.m. You can send those in to Catherine uh, Lariviere, our uh, awesome office administrator. Um, um, and her email and uh, the phone number are again in the email blast each week or probably, yeah, right there. I always forget the, the announcements are there behind me. So I think that those are all the announcements that I wanted to bring to your attention for this morning. Um, and I'm going to invite you to rise as you feel able to greet one another with a sign of Christ peace. Please be seated. And friends, I'm going to invite you to join me in our candle lighting prayer. Let's speak these words together. Responsibly. Christ Jesus, as we light this candle, candle a symbol of your love. At each stage of life, Help us to choose service over status. And to embrace the power of discipleship with joy. Amen. Let's join now in singing um, a hymn that's often known as the Servant Song, but also known as We Are Pilgrims. We'll sing the first, third, and sixth verse. Let's sing together. So I, I have a bit of a game that I want to play with you during our uh, our spirit exchange time. So we're going to do, I because uh, you folks are always really good at making sounds, and you're just generally a wacky bunch of folks, and so I'm, I'm going to ask you to help me make some sounds. What, what do you see happening in this far image on the left? Okay, perfect. But can, we, can we all do some keep Keep it rolling, keep it rolling. Okay, that's good. Okay, um, now, uh, don't make the sound yet, but what do you see um, here? Angry cat. Angry cat, right, exactly. Grumpy cat. Now, is, are there any cat owners here? <laughs> Good. And so, I don't know about you. So, so Doreen, I love your meow. Was that you? No? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I heard the meow there. Uh, I, I want to do a pre-meow, because sometimes I find that our cat, if they're, if they're not happy with something, they'll kind of do a pre-meow, where it's kind of like... Do, do, have you ever heard that before? Can, can I hear you trying doing that? You can loosen the phlegm at the back of your throat. Do the... Oh, come on, a bit louder. Oh, okay, that's good. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, the next uh, one... 
Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Let's let's. You know what it is. Let's let's hear that. Okay. Perfect. Okay. And now, does anybody know what this bird is? Okay. Yeah. If I can populate it, is that that? Okay. Good. Yeah. So what I would like, and I'm hearing some great. Um, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to imagine the woodpecker going from the bottom up to the top. So I want to see you to start low and then kind of go. Okay? Okay, so let's, can you do this? And then this? Okay, good. Yeah? <laughs> okay, now I'm going to do something that has nothing to do with the images, but everything to do with the sounds. Are you ready? Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna act it out. You're gonna do the sounds, and then at the end, I want you to guess what I was doing. Okay? So don't do the sound yet. I'll do for one. I want you to do. Yeah. Okay. For two, I want you to do. Oh, yeah. For three, I want you to do. For four, I want you to do. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna mime it out, and you're gonna figure out what I'm what I'm trying to do. Okay, so okay, here we go. Okay, um, okay, now. Hmm? Okay, and. one? Come on, you got to do it. Hmm. Okay, Did, can you guess what I was doing? Making coffee. Making coffee. Oh, great. Good job with Paul. Okay. I, I swear I didn't Paul, tell Paul beforehand. You get the big prize, Paul, of getting to continue to organize everything upstairs for the sanctuary. Okay. okay. <laughs> Okay, good. You know, I thought you were going to take longer to, to get that. Because sometimes, it, did everybody know what I was doing right away? No? Okay, yeah. So, yeah, it was, yeah, getting the water, right? And then we were starting to hear the, the whatever the thing is. I don't make coffee, right? So I don't even know what it's called, kettle. Um, it's starting to boil, and then it was starting to hiss, and then we were pouring out the water into the, did you all get that for the, for the four different things? Okay. Perfect. Sometimes it takes us a little bit to start to, to get things. And part of, that's what part of being in community is being disciples. Because sometimes um, disciples in the Bible, but us too, it takes us a while just to kind of catch on to things, get into things, start to learn about what it means to be a people of faith. But Jesus stays with us and helps us learn. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And some of the, the rites of passage, what does that mean? We'll, we'll talk a, bit, a little bit later that helps us pass from different stages of understanding in our lives. Would you pray with me, though, before we keep on going? Sure. And will you make all those sounds as we pray? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Okay, let's, you, you pray after me. God, we thank you, God, we thank you. for being with us, for being with us. Helping, us to learn, helping us to learn, loving us, loving us at every stage of life. Stage of life. Amen. Amen. All right. And so, if any young people do want to hang out in the awesome room, you are welcome to do so, or you can stay in for the, the service, because I'm going to be actually talking about some things that, that our young people told me about back in June. But before we do that, do we have a ministry of music, Yvonne? All right. We sounds, do. Okay. <laughs> no guarantee. <laughs>
music team, and thank you, Yvonne. Folks, aren't we really blessed? Like, we have this awesome music director, Diane, who plays music all through the year. And we have an awesome individual like Yvonne, who just does such a great job. So thank you so much to Yvonne and all of you. All right. Well, let me see here. All right, I'm, I'm not going yet. Doreen, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Christ Jesus, you are the Word made flesh. May your message of hope become flesh in us as we reflect together in this place. Amen. So folks, I, I'm going to tell you right now, for this sermon, I am completely out of my depth, because many of you know I do not drink coffee. I am not a coffee drinker. But I'm going to make a pledge at the beginning of this service. Today is going to be the first time that I ever drink coffee in Trenton United Church. Okay? So unless, uh, is there actually coffee after the service? Yes. Okay, that's good. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Just want to say, I want lots of milk and sugar in it, by the way, because um, I'm feeling a bit worried about this. Oh, okay, hot or cold. All right, perfect. This is great. Okay, I'm ex Oh, yeah, I can put the hot chocolate in, right, with the, with the coffee. Okay, that's going to make it better. Okay, I'm, I'm feeling less uh, less worried about this. Okay. Um, why, why do I want to do this? Why? why um, so you might remember that there were, um, back at the beginning of June, there was a service where our awesome music team and our awesome music director, Diane, led a service. And dur during that service, I had the opportunity to head out with our Sunday school. And uh, Betty and I um, led the, the Sunday school session. And one of the things that we did was we talked about some of the things that people would like to be able to do in the summer um, in a way to be able to talk about some of the different subjects that we might be able to look at at services this month. And so some of the things that people talked about for, that they wanted to be able to do this summer were things like going to the pool, 
um, playing with a bunny rabbit or uh, maybe some other animals, going cycling or skateboarding. And the last one that our Sunday school is very excited about is drinking coffee. Our Sunday school members are really into drinking coffee. Um, and I was a bit worried about this at first. I went home and Googled it afterwards. And I was like, does coffee stunt the growth of young people? Apparently that's not real. That was just something that we, we learned. Maybe it was just parents who don't want their kids to be all hyped up on caffeine. Um, but so this was one of the things. So I'm gonna start today with talking about coffee because sometimes drinking coffee can in, in a way be a rite of passage. Now what does that mean? What, is the, what are these words, rite of passage? And what does that have to do with coffee? So I, I'm just gonna take the, the definition that you get off of Google from Oxford uh, Language Center. A rite of passage is a ceremony or an event marking an important stage in somebody's life, especially around the time of birth or puberty or marriage or even death. Now, it's interesting because rites of passage, um, I think they were much more present in our Western society um, in past decades and years than I would say they are today. And it was interesting when I was doing my spiritual care training and pastoral care training in the hospital system in Quebec. We went to this conference that was all about rites of passage. And they talked about how, in some ways, it has a psychological effect on people in, in different parts of their lives that we don't have quite as many rites of passage, that it can be a way to help us move from one stage of our life to another. And if you're still kind of wondering, what is this whole rite of passage thing? Within our Christian tradition, you might think of baptism being a rite of passage. Um, depending on which Christian tradition uh, you grew up in, First Communion might have been something, or Confirmation, a rite of passage, or marriage, or even funerals. Um, and I'm going to talk all through this August time about different rites of passage, but maybe um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of those sacraments and rituals that we commonly think about in Christianity, but I also want to take some, some different looks at things like drinking coffee, because I think drinking coffee can kind of be like a rite of passage. And you know, there's all kinds of different beverages that we drink at different times in our lives. Um, you think about it in terms of when we are babies, there are decisions that our parents or our caregivers might make about uh, breastfeeding or bottle feeding or when will uh, a baby first be able to have a formula. So that can be a kind of rite of passage uh, moving forward just when, when a, um, a human being is quite small. I know in our family we, we had um, a lot of decision making about when would be the first time that someone in our family was allowed to drink a can of pop because in terms of the sugar and the different things that can be, uh, you know, it's a, lot of dis it's a discussion for a lot of different families. Um, maybe for some of you, um, uh, well, probably none of you here, but let's just say hypothetically, you might have taken a sip of wine at the family dinner table at some point, and uh, uh, none, none of you would have done that. But, but uh, um, or you know, when you turn 19, uh, to the ability to be able to um, maybe have a beer at a, at, a, at a restaurant or something like that. I think also we need to be aware too, we were talking that earlier today that we have an AA group who meets here regularly every single week on the, the evening before we come here. And so we were aware that for some people, um, an alcoholic beverage might be something that, uh, that they struggle with or that can be a problem for either them or for the people around them. And so maybe there's a stage in our lives where we have a first sip of a non-alcoholic beer. That's also a possibility um, as a movement from different stages in our lives. And then the last one, I was trying to think of, of ones that we might talk about later on in life. And I was thinking, you know, Lisa did that really great presentation uh, for us about par and about being regular. Do you remember that one that she, she did? And I was thinking, you know, when is the first time where we, maybe we start to drink more prune juice as, uh, as we get older and different possibilities? You know, there's all kinds of different beverages that help us along the way and help us usher, usher us into different parts of our life. How many people here drink coffee? Okay, lots of people drink coffee. Can you help me name 
uh, you know, this is just going to be an educational experience for me. What do you love about drinking coffee? Sleep. Oh, sorry, what was the first thing? Puts me to sleep. It puts you to sleep. Okay, I was not expecting that in terms of. I thought. Does, does, so some people puts you to sleep. For, it wakes. Okay, it wakes Yvonne up. So it gives you some energy. Okay. Is there anything else that you love about coffee? The, the flavor and the taste. And it, would anybody say the smell? Even for me, even though I don't like drinking coffee, I love the smell of coffee. Anything else that you like about coffee? Anything? No? Uh, so I, I asked the internet, what were the top five reasons? That, oh yeah, Emma, what do you love about coffee? What's that? Mocha. Mocha, okay, all right. <laughs> Mocha as, a, as an aspect of coffee, yeah, that's really good. In terms of coffee, um, sometimes it can be the social connection. That's a big thing that people enjoy. Because everybody, except for the minister of Trenton United Church, drinks coffee. It's something that, uh, <laughs> that we, uh, a lot of us hold in common uh, to be able to. You don't either? OK, all right. So we can have our own club afterwards where we drink hot chocolate. But lots of people do get, we call it the coffee time, where we all gather around together. Some people like the routine of it. It helps them start their day, or maybe uh, rest to end your day. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of having coffee, I know for myself when I was doing that pilgrimage in Spain, that was pretty much the only time that I drank coffee because it helped me get up in the morning because I was exhausted every day. And actually, coffee has health benefits too. I hadn't realized that. Now, if you're drinking like 20 cups a day, um, it, it might be overboard. But if you have a few cups a day, it can help in different ways in terms of our health. And it can be a way of entering into that sense of maybe feeling a bit more adult as we move forward in terms of drinking coffee. So what, what does drinking coffee, though, have to do with our Bible passage that we heard Doreen read so beautifully for us today? Well, I don't know if you remember, there is this passage. James and John are going to speak with Jesus. They are followers. They've been hanging out with Jesus for a while. And they, they go and they talk to Jesus and they say, you know, Jesus, when you come into your glory, we want to be on your right hand and on your left hand. We want to be right there with you. And Jesus is a bit hesitant when he hears this. And he says, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they feel ready. They feel ready to move forward and they say, yes, we are. Now, when Jesus talks about a cup that he is going to drink from, for those of you who have attended different um, Holy Week services um, here at Trenton United Church, you may remember on Monday Thursday when Jesus is getting close to his death on the cross. He goes to a garden and he says, I don't really want to drink this cup that's, that's coming up. He talks about it metaphorically in terms of the passion and perhaps even the suffering and pain that he is about to face. And he says, I don't want to drink this cup. And so maybe he's worried for James and John in terms of what they are about to take on. But they are eager to be able to be with Jesus, to keep on following him. And he says in the end, listen, it's not all completely up to me. I won't be the one who is making the selections on who is the right and the left. But he does say, yes, you will be there and you will drink of this cup that I am going to be drinking from as well. There is this sense that they are welcomed in, but there's a little bit of a conflict afterwards, right? The other disciples here, they say, wait a second, they're going to get to drink this cup, and, and, and I don't get to drink this cup, and they're going to be your right-hand man, and, I, and they are begin to duke it out, and while well, they might not have thrown um, punches, but there's a bit of a conflict that is there, and there's a sense of uncertainty in terms of who will be the best who will be there as the top follower of Jesus. And I, I think it's important to remember that the conflict doesn't start until the end. Uh, sometimes we think that Jesus is immediately criticizing James and John, but maybe they're just eager to be able to be there with Jesus. Maybe there's a bit of status that they want, but perhaps it's just their deep love for who Jesus is as a person and who he is as the presence of God in their lives. And so Jesus responds to this argument by saying, listen, you've seen how people duke it out in different parts of the world and in, in different situations of power. 
But I want you to take a different approach in life. I came not for all of you to serve me or to have a right man hand and a left man man or person uh, there beside me. I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. There is the sense that Jesus has come to give of himself, to be a servant, to be able to offer himself in a way that will change the world through the deep giving of his love to all those around him. And so discipleship becomes so much about service and the sense of drinking of the cup is entering into a new way of serving other people. When we think about serving coffee, um, we might think, in terms of our Sunday school, they're ready, so that, so how many of our Sunday school are actually already drinking coffee? I think a few of them, yeah, so some of them already have been sampling. Oh yeah, Tobias, you, you are too? Okay, awesome. Um, and so, they're already there, and they're enjoying it. I don't think that they're just doing that, though, because they're like, uh, well, we want to we want to have we want to be Reverend Isaac's right hand man and left hand man. Is is that right? You're you're not just wanting to necessarily uh, be because I, I mean I don't even you're already more mature than I am really in terms of uh, in terms of your drinking coffee. But what I do see in terms of our young people and both members of our Sunday school and the teenagers who are a part of our congregation are people who really love to offer their service. And in their discipleship, they are truly servants in this place in so many different ways. We can think about the ways that oftentimes um, they have learned how to use the dishwasher, and so they are cleaning the dishes after the coffee hour. They teach Sunday school. They sing in our music team. They run messy church tables. They knit and crochet. They serve at church meals. They ride in the walk and roll to be able to help people who are refugees coming into our country. There is this sense for so many of the young people who are here, they are not just spectators, they are servants. And I think, when I think of our congregation, and I look out at people of all different generations, I am so amazed at the service that is offered by so many people, that this, in some ways, is a place of worship, where we serve God through our singing and through our prayers, but it is also a place where we learn to be disciples and where we learn how to serve one another and also the wider world. And so when we think of rites of passage and taking that drink of coffee, in some ways, it is a symbol of entering into that place of serving, of following the Christ who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, Jesus talks about this dichotomy of this back and forth, we might say, between status and service. I was thinking about my grandpa, my grandpa Putnam, my mom's dad, who um, was a leader in the Presbyterian Church. He was the minister at uh, St. Andrews in Kingston. He was a uh, moderator within the Presbyterian Church. That's right, yeah, Max Putnam. And he, it was interesting, I was talking to somebody, uh, I went to a concert. Uh, some of you folks might know my Uncle Eric, he's come and played music here on a number of different occasions, and they were playing uh, a concert at a place north of Kingston, and somebody came up to me and said, you know, I think I've seen your face before, are you Isaac Mundy? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, you know, I know your parents really well. He's a minister in the United Church, and I knew your grandpa Putnam really well. And he said, it was always amazing when we would go and see him preaching at St. Andrews in Kingston, because people were in awe of your grandpa. And when he would come in, there was this silence and this feeling like people were almost ready to bow down there in terms of, in terms of his speaking. And it was interesting hearing about that for me, because when we think about ministers today, I don't know if, well, I definitely would say for myself, I don't think I necessarily evoke awe when I come in here. Would, would you say that that's probably, yeah, you're all laughing, you. Uh, this isn't the, it's not quite the same level of status that we have in terms of these positions of ministry. Now, interestingly for my grandpa, Later on in his life, I didn't know him as this person who was uh, a person that evoked awe when he came into the room. He later moved to 
a more rural area, he spent some time in ministry in Australia, and then moved to a more rural area uh, outside of Renfrew, outside of Ottawa, uh, and ran a, uh, a different, different forms of retreat ministries. And, uh, but I knew him as this humble person where I would come down when we were visiting them in the morning, and he would talk about how he didn't want to have to drink so much water because uh, uh, I had to go with his medications and he was feeling frustrated. But he was this very down-to-earth individual. And I know he was this person who served in this deep way. We have seen changes in our church in terms of the ways that we understand the status of the church in society and of ministers in society. But maybe some of those changes are helpful because it can help us to enter more deeply into that sense of how we are called to be people of service in the world. That we're not all about having status or the top spot in society. What we are called to do is follow Jesus into those places that sometimes are more humble and perhaps not as well known, but where Christ wants to go to help the most vulnerable and to help those who are most deeply in need. So when we come to church, it's not to check off uh, a status mark, but instead to be part of this laboratory where we learn how to serve and to serve one another and the wider world, to follow that awesome example of our young people and our less young people who serve one another in so many beautiful ways. We spoke not too long ago at council about it, what it means to help equip people for service in the life of the church. So we can think, too, as we move from stage to stage in our life of being a community of faith and the rites of passage that we move through, whether that's drinking coffee or some of the different ways that I'll speak about um, moving from stage to stage later on in this month, we can look both at our young folks and, and for all folks in this community as agents and disciples. Every one of us here are disciples of Jesus. I want to thank you for being a disciple of Jesus, for the ways that you pray, for the ways that you serve, for the ways that you worship the God of love and serve our creator in ways that make a difference in our world and in our hearts. We are called to be a people willing to mentor one another in our different rites of passage. We are called, too, to recognize that those up-and-coming folks in our community might have new ways of understanding about how we can do things and to honor those new ways of being in the world. We ultimately are equipped by Jesus. We, like James and John and those other disciples, who follow Jesus are called to drink of different cups, whether that might be from the coffee cup after the service or sometimes even more challenging, metaphorical cups that Jesus speaks of. We're called to mentor with love and patience. We're called to let go of condescension. We know in this world, right, that there are all kinds of power struggles, and we see it in all kinds of different ways. We've seen it in the news over the last month when we think about um, all of the, the machinations that are taking place in the American political world, or when we think about leaders like Trudeau and Polyev, when we think about Venezuela and the struggles for power in those places, it can be scary, it can be frustrating, but we are called to always remember that beneath those struggles for power, Christ, like, like this underground stream, is there as a presence of service. Christ giving up his life and calling each one of us to all those different forms of service where we are open to the possibilities of love of one another, open to the dreams that are held in this place. And so friends, I invite you to drink deeply of this call to discipleship. I invite you to drink of this love of Christ which serves us but then also inspires us to serve others. Let's continue to move through the rites of passage that are so important in our communities of faith. Let's keep on drinking coffee. I'm excited about it at the end of this service. Let's continue to love one another as a people of faith. And let us pray these words together. Christ Jesus, help us to drink from the cup of your teaching 
and to be blessed by the grace of your baptism. Teach us to serve rather than to be served, and to welcome others at different stages of life as we learn to follow you. Amen. And folks, let's join now in singing our next hymn, which is, Wash, O God, Our Sons and Daughters. giving and receiving. Let us bring before God our tithes and our offerings as we sing. to the beauty of your creation, for the laughing of waves, the sound of morning doves, the smell of fresh mown grass and fireflies at night. We praise you for the energy you give us to meet the challenge of this world. In the face of the world's conflicts, embolden us to seek justice. In the midst of anxiety, give us your peace. In times of grief and sadness, bring your tender love. God, in particular on this day, we pray for the people of Venezuela and Bangladesh. We pray for communities in Tayanda 
we pray for the people of the Middle East. We pray for all those impacted by forest fires in our country. Help us to honor and cherish the rituals of transition in our lives, welcoming your holy presence into times of change. When the powers of this world work to divide your people and creation through sectarianism, bigotry, and war, find ways to weave us back together as communities and societies as we seek together for the common good. Heal us, God. Mend our bodies when they are ailing, soothe our hearts when we are fretting, cure our souls when we have turned from you. We pray all these things as we lift up the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, let's join now in singing our closing hymn, which is the church's one foundation. And we'll sing verses 1, 4, and 5. one another let's speak these words together may you know that you are beloved and that in god you rest in safety may the holy spirit surround you all day long and may christ rest between your shoulders and friends if you go out from this place know that there will be times where we pass from one moment of life to the next but christ is always there with us Go out not to be served, but to serve, to be part of this message of good news of the one who gave his life for many and who transforms all of our lives. Go now in peace. peace.